In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord uses harsh, shocking language in the Gospel today. He speaks of exorcism, demons, amputations, and hell. Why does he talk like this? It's not really what you'd expect in the Church of England on a Sunday morning, maybe down the road, but not in the Church of England, is it? But perhaps the parable of the ducks can help us understand why. Once upon a time, there was a little town of ducks. Every Sunday, the ducks, who were very devout, waddled out of their homes and waddled down the street to their church. They waddle into the nave, sit in the accustomed places in the pews. And then the duck choir processes in, singing the opening hymn. And the duck priest comes down to read from the duck gospel. This is what he says. Ducks, God has given you wings. With wings you can fly. With wings you can mount up and soar like eagles. No walls can confine you. No fences can hold you. You have wings. God has given you wings and you could fly like all the other birds. And the ducks say, Amen. And after the final hymn and coffee, the duck priest and the duck congregation all waddle home. Now, the disciples in the gospel today are as clueless as those ducks. They're blind and they're deaf to the truth. The context of our Lord's words to them is his journey to the cross. Remember, he's been speaking openly about his impending death. And it's not just talk. He's making his way towards Jerusalem. He's making his way away from safety, away from home, and towards the cross. And he knows he's running out of time. He doesn't have long now to prepare the disciples for what's coming. And so Jesus ramps things up. We can sense his growing sense of urgency in his exaggerated and violent language. The American Southern Gothic writer Flannery O'Connor used grotesque, shocking, larger than life situations in her stories. They're stories that are all about the grace of God, but they're also shockingly violent. For example, in a story called A Good Man is Hard to Find, one of her most famous stories, a grandmother meets an escaped serial killer called the Misfit on a trip to the country with her grandchildren. What can possibly go wrong? It doesn't end well for her. But I think the last words of the stories I remember are, Misfit says something like, she would have been a saint, that woman, if I could have killed her every day. Flannery O'Connor explained why she used such shocking situations in her stories. She wrote, when you assume your audience holds the same beliefs you do, you can relax a little bit and use more normal means for talking to it. When you have to assume that it does not understand what you're talking about and have the same beliefs, then you have to make your vision apparent by shock. To the hard of hearing, you shout. For the almost blind, you draw large and startling figures. Maybe this is what Jesus is doing in the gospel today shocking his disciples into understanding by drawing large and startling figures. This is what he says. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed with one hand than to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Pluck out your own eye. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm that eats them does not die and the fire is not quenched. Last week, we heard how the disciples were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. This week, they're upset about a stranger who's casting out demons in the name of Jesus. What are you going to do about it, Jesus, they say. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. Following us. Imagine Jesus' response. Haven't they been listening at all? Don't they get it? Don't they see? This question shows their selfish desire to control his mission. Mark the boundaries of who's in and who's out. Don't they see? Once again, they've shown their desire 
to be the greatest rather than the least, to be the ones with power rather than the ones who serve. No, says Jesus, no, let him be. Whoever's not against us is for us. And then he drops a bombshell into their playground. He tells them, being a Christian, following me, is so much more exciting, more joyful than all this pettiness. Etern eternity, heaven, hell, it's all real and it all hangs in the balance. It makes me think of the first few pages of Tolkien's great classic, The Hobbit. Remember the story, the great wizard Gandalf knocks on the door of Bilbo Baggins. And Bilbo is a hobbit. And hobbits are quiet folk, people who love their hearth and home. They love to smoke pipes, they love to eat their second breakfasts, and they're decidedly adverse to adventures and to risk and to danger. And Gandalf loves what they love too. He also smokes a pipe, if you remember. But he also knows about strange events that are unfolding outside, beyond Bilbo's little world in the Shire. There's a world out there that's far more mysterious, far more dangerous, far more glorious than Bilbo's aware of. And Gandalf wants to enlist Bilbo for an epic journey out into that world beyond the Shire. I see us, along with the first disciples, as like Bilbo Baggins. Jesus knows the whole world, the whole universe. He has full knowledge of the adventure, the road ahead of us. We need the shock of his knock at our door. We need him to tell us that we belong to a greater world than we can imagine. A world where we'll have to use our wings. So the challenge for us, I think today, is really to believe, really to believe in a larger, deeper reality than our secularised culture wants us to. Our culture that keeps us busy, keeps us distracted from who we really are. Without belief in God and life after death, we forget who we are and we live in a shrunken world with a diminished sense even of what it means to be human. For the saint is for the sinner. Everything for people around us, they believe, ends at our deaths. So why bother trying to be good? Moral failure doesn't require drastic action. Life's too short, that's what people say, isn't it? Life's too short. But what if, what if, just imagine the possibility that life doesn't end when we die. And beyond this life is God. We come to God. What we believed, what we had faith in, what we maybe weren't sure about sometimes, we know is true and real. Beyond this life is God. It's all true. And if all of the four last things are real, judgment, heaven and hell, as well as death, now there's a new seriousness to sin. Perhaps it can even be described as mortal. People talk about mortal sin because it can kill. Now, the analogy is clearer that compares an amputation that saves someone's life and the demanding repentance that leads to eternal life. You know, if someone has gangrene in their leg, people would amputate. That's what Jesus compares demanding repentance to, to an operation that can save our life, an amputation. At a biological level, an amputation may be necessary. That's how you carry on living. And Jesus compares that to the need for repentance in the life of the Spirit. The good we do, the merits we acquire, will make us flourish permanently in the kingdom. An unrepented mortal sin will block that. It will be an obstacle for us when we reach the end of our earthly lives. So the challenge then is really to believe that who we are will not end with our biological death. If we start believing that, really believing that, then we may need to take drastic action to change our lives and stop being distracted, stop being too busy to repent and believe in the gospel. In today's gospel, the teaching of Jesus is urgent. He says, it is better to enter into life. 
Amen.